Hi, my name is Mike Leiden. I'm welcoming you to the Tactical Urbanism 202 session at CNU 21 in Salt Lake City. I am the principal of a company called the Street Plans Collaborative, and we're based in Miami and New York City. We're a planning, design, and research advocacy firm. And Tactical Urbanism is one of our research projects that we've been undertaking for the past couple of years. So what is Tactical Urbanism? We've been studying for the last two years, as I said, short-term actions that lead to long-term change. As Professor Nabil Hanu says, it's about getting it right for now, and at the same time being tactical and strategic about later, and about disturbing the order of things in the interests of change. So really these are short-term and temporary moves that create a change in the built environment that can inform change for the long term. Our company, Street Plans, and some of our collaborators have created two different volumes looking at tactical urbanism around um, the United States. And the second volume uh, came out in April of 2012, um, helped really bring this movement to, um, to wider understanding within the planning, design, architecture community. Plan Edison made a top planning trend in 2012, as did the Urban Times. Um, this traction has helped more and more people become interested in using short-term in inexpensive projects to see longer-term change. Uh, our readership has gone global. Uh, last week alone, we saw uh, more than a dozen countries downloading this booklet which is free online and which we encourage you to download at streetplans.org. But tactical urbanism is not a new movement, uh, not at all. In fact, we're keen on saying that that's, this is really how cities developed for the majority of, of history. Small moves, inexpensive changes, increment by incrementing, making places better day by day and week by week, year by year. Uh, here's an example called portable architecture from 1970, where an artist mocked up a Park in the sh for a short term period underneath the freeway in San Francisco. There's a commentary on the lack of public space and green space in that city. And it was meant to change people's perception about what that space given over to, to highway infrastructure could actually be. Some of the key drivers of this movement, um, we'll go into much more detail during the 202, but we'll look you know, at the Great Recession and how that has influenced urbanism and the need to create change with fewer and fewer resources. Uh, shifting demographics with uh, baby boomers and uh, young adults moving into cities in, in large numbers and, and trying to change those neighborhoods in, in their image and what they want to see happen for the longer term using short-term actions. And of course, the way these ideas are spreading is largely via the Internet. Um, the Internet becomes this tool for, we say, building the civic economy. We'll look at um, several different case studies from around the United States and, and, and abroad on where tactical urbanism is being applied. In Volume 2, we have 24 different case studies, but in the last year alone, we've probably doubled those in the number that we've researched. One example of how tactical urbanism works to change city spaces is looking at the Broadway corridor in New York City. Here on the screen, you see an image of um, Midtown Manhattan. And in 1969, there was a plan that was finished by the Regional Plan Association to pedestrianize Broadway between Central Park and Union Square. Um, of course, if you know the history of New York City, um, that project never actually happened um, for a variety of different reasons. One, to get enough support to make that permanent change was nearly impossible until 2009 when the city's Department of Transportation very quickly, basically overnight, decided to test out the concept and literally closed Times Square to automobile traffic by using orange cones and foldable beach chairs. Uh, for a very low cost of probably a couple thousand dollars, the whole idea was just to test it, uh, to disrupt that space and see what the impact would be and measure the results. Um, what they found very quickly was that there was a really positive uh, impact on uh, Times Square as one of the signature public spaces in New York City. So then they improved that space a little bit more with temporary materials such as paint, movable chairs, and umbrellas just to give it a little bit more of a permanent feel. And this, of course, was part of a larger project which um, removed a lot of space from uh, motor vehicles along that entire corridor of Broadway from Central Park down to Union Square. Throughout this process, the city was measuring a lot of data. They were looking at the impact it had economically on safety and on traffic flow. And what they found was that all indicators uh, came back positive, that this was a very uh, wonderful change for New York City and for Times Square. So then they've committed to making this a permanent public space by 2014. And here's a rendering of what that may or may not look like in the coming years. So this is short-term action 
you know, orange cones and lawn chairs that within a five year sort of capital cycle leads to long term change. And of course this is not just something that's applied to dense places like New York City, but here is an example of tactical urbanism um, as applied to Seaside, Florida. Here you see an aerial of Seaside in the 1960s um, as a completely rural environment. Of course, we all know what happened in the, starting in the 1980s, um, but today it looks something like this. But of course, this, this did not happen overnight. This took a lot of creativity to create something out of, out of nothing. And largely what we found in looking at the history of Seaside is that um, as much then as, as they do today, they've been using tactical urbani urbanism to see long-term change. Um, here's a great quote from Andres Duwani. Um, saying that you know the plan was really pretty spot on and that it got built out, but what they didn't foresee happening was uh, the success of the temporary retail shacks along along the beach and how that had incubated other businesses that had become um, you know moved on to more permanent spaces within Seaside. But also, this remains one of the more human scale and active places within the entire community. And of course, today if you visit um, right along um, the main road. Going through the project, you will see tactical urbanism alive and well today uh, with use of uh, food carts and um, inexpensive seating areas to enliven this space before it's uh, again finished and built out permanently. So how do we implement tactical urbanism? Well, it starts with ideation, coming up with um, uh, ideas on what needs to change and how that might happen creatively with short-term or uh, minimal resources. So thinking about how we can work with communities to, um, to crowdsource ideas and come up with opportunities to use tactical urbanism to see long-term change. And what we find is that this process really is, um, you know, it learns from um, what uh, Eric Rice coined the lean startup. So instead of tech companies or uh, we're thinking about urban design projects, but the same process seems to, to work with tactical urbanism. It's about creating ideas, building it out in a very short-term way, um, by creating projects and then measuring the impact, um, taking the data and then feeding that back into a, a learning cycle that creates new ideas on how to further improve the, the, the project and catalyze on its hopeful success. So the build, measure, learn process is one that can be used, and if it's used quickly, um, you know, the faster that it's used, the faster that long-term change can be created. Funding these projects is, um, is always a challenge. Um, whether it's a two thousand dollar project or a two million dollar project, it always has to be an effort to, to find the right funding to match the project. And one thing we want to recommend is a tool called IOB. We'll be looking at um, this online platform for crowdsourcing urban and green projects. Um, it's a nationwide tool that's being applied to cities all over the country, and it's just one example of how we will look at creatively funding uh, tactical urbanism projects. And then moving on to implementation. How do you implement? Who are the actors? Um, how do you get permission? Um, what if uh, you don't have permission? What do you do in these instances? Well, we will walk you through all the best practices for tactical urbanism implementation. An example here of how literally change can be created overnight is a project actually from my neighborhood where, again, in New York City, using uh, temporary materials that can be applied very, very quickly, you can get almost an instant public space. And of course, as some of you may know who are listening right now, these temporary spaces are now becoming permanent. So it's a way to test um, improvements. If they go well, then you can move forward with permanent change and not waste the resources up front, not knowing you're going to have a success or not. But of course, you need to know uh, how your projects are performing. So we will also look at evaluation. Um, what are the best practices for evaluating projects? And here's a good example from a project in downtown Cleveland called Pop-Up Rockwell where a uh, temporary two-lane, uh, two-way bike facility was created in the downtown. And this was a really creative project that was, um, that was measured for an entire week, and they took a lot of data. And what they found out was that in a positive way, ridership, bike ridership along the street doubled. But they also learned that their design wasn't, uh, wasn't perfect, that's for sure. And so by testing it out with very inexpensive materials, and, and seeing what the results were, they were able to tweak the design moving forward, which means that it creates a much more efficient project delivery process and allows them to understand how to deliver change in the long term in a more effective, intelligent way. So we'll be in Salt Lake City. What can be done in this city? Uh, I'm sure plenty of things. And so we're going to actually, um, yeah, after we answer all of your questions, 
move out to a site uh, nearby where we will be meeting and having the 202 session and get out in the field and break you up into teams and work on coming up with uh, potential uh, responses to a challenging site in downtown Salt Lake City. Uh, we may or may not get to building something out, but at least you will be able to walk through those steps in practice with a real site to be trained on how to conduct a tactical urbanism project. And of course, I will not be doing this alone. I'm going to be joined by four excellent um, uh, co-teachers in this 202 session. We'll have Aaron Barnes from IOB, which I've already mentioned. We will have Tommy Pacello from the Memphis Innovation Delivery Team. Uh, they've been doing lots of tactical urbanism projects with great success in Memphis as a, as a very strategic way to create sustained change in, in their core neighborhoods. We'll have Jason Roberts, who's one of the co-founders of Build a Better Block, um, a very popular tactical urbanism um, project that's in Dallas and has been applied to now dozens and dozens of cities all over the world. Jason's got high energy and a great experience in actually implementing these projects and will be a great addition to our team. And then we'll also be joined by Ian Ross from Oakland, who runs a firm called the City Design Collective. And Ian will be helping us out look at the, um, the collaborative nature of these projects and how to carry them out successfully. So you can make a difference. We know that. We know that most of the, the effective projects are collaborative, they're open, and they bring together both the community and the city to create positive change for the long term. We hope that you'll come join us at CNU uh, for this 202 session in Salt Lake City. Thank you.